Hey Fred, what season of SpongeBob are we on? Hmm. Three? <laughs> Thanks, Fred. I'm not even going to pull any punches here. Season 3 of SpongeBob SquarePants is fantastic. Like I mentioned at the end of the last video, Season 1 is the season that started the foundation of the show, Season 2 is the season that built upon that foundation, even if I like Season 1 more, but still, and Season 3 is the season that perfected that foundation. It feels like the perfect mixture of Season 1's laid-back nature and Season 2's really sharp comedy. And let me emphasize that last part, because Season 3 is absolutely drenched in god-tier cartoon comedy. I'm so excited to talk about a majority of Season 3's 37 episode segments just because of how fucking funny most of them are. Spoilers for later in this retrospective, but even though Season 3 isn't my favorite season of the entire show, it's easily my favorite pre-movie season, and it's really high up on my overall season ranking. It's really weird to think how Spongebob is such a massive juggernaut of a franchise, now that this season could still be considered to be in the show's infancy stage. Season 1 may have been a modest success, but Season 2, and especially Season 3, are the seasons that launched the show into infinite stardom. Even though I'm really glad that the show didn't end after Season 3, this would not have been a bad season to go out on at all. But you know what? No more pussyfooting around. It is time for the Fannies! Come on, I had to. The opportunity presented itself. So, the grass is always greener on the other side, huh? I think Plankton has some words for you. Usually these types of character switching places stories would present the perspectives of both of the characters in the Switch Hub. But here we only see Plankton's perspective, which I don't mind. For the first time in series history, this short stack is large and in charge. Uh, figuratively of course. And he fucking hates it, baby. I didn't think we were going to get an episode this funny this soon, but holy crap, this one is a comedy goldmine. Apparently this one is actually Spongebob writer Paul Tibbetts' favorite episode of the whole show. Excellent choice, my man. I have to admit though, not a lot of plot or story happens in this one, as after Plankton's life gets switched, the entire rest of the episode is just him being annoyed by Spongebob, Squidward, Mr. Krabs, and Pearl. But the jokes just hit you with such a one-two punch in every single scene that I legitimately don't even care. From what I've researched, it seems as though the first few episodes of Season 3 were originally going to be in Season 2, but were later moved. And if this episode ended up in Season 2 like it was originally planned, then this would have been number 4 on that list. But in Season 3, it's still a 10 out of 10 and goes to number 6 on the list. Damn! Season 3's Bouncer is easily the strongest so far. Also, yo, this is totally the first Spongebob episode where Spongebob himself doesn't appear. Even though he's right fucking there. Dumbass. Glorious opener to the season. I am so excited for more. Wow, I've really gotta stop setting myself up for underwhelming punchlines. SpongeGuard on Duty is one that I'm personally extremely mixed on. It's got a decent handful of stuff I like, such as once again being a Goo Lagoon episode, this being one of like four or five episodes in the whole series where Larry the Lobster actually has an important role in the story, and a few really funny jokes such as Dude Put That Thing Away, The Flying Ice Cream Truck, and I fucking love this visual gag where Spongebob screams and his big gaping mouth forms a perfect square shape. Other than that though, this is another one where the story was kind of left at sea to drown. Once Spongebob assumes lifeguard duty, the episode's pacing comes to a screeching halt as Spongebob becomes annoyingly incompetent, and I'm sorry, I just find this irritating. Wouldn't it make more sense for the conflict to be something along the lines of Spongebob trying to fix things around the beach to make things more fun for the beachgoers? I feel like that would fit in with his character more. Like, it's fine, it's like a 6 out of 10 and goes to number 31 on my ranking and all that, but I really don't care about this one. Also, just a heads up, this is going to be the video in this retrospective where I probably mention the writers the most. Writers such as Walt Dorn, Bill Reese, and even Mr. Lawrence stopped writing episodes for the show after season 2. 
for the most part anyway. So season three had some shoes to fill. Jay Lender's new writing and storyboarding partner for most of the rest of the season is this new guy named Sam Henderson. That's cool. I sure hope the rest of their episodes are better because this was kind of a weak start for them, honestly. <laughs> Is that the Forest Maze theme from Super Mario RPG? Yo! <laughs> Characters getting lost in the woods plots are pretty much a dime a dozen at this point, and they can either be really fun and atmospheric, or really annoying with almost no in-between. This one is kind of both? A lot of the gags here are great, and I really like what we see of the kelp forest setting but most of the episode is just the three stooges sitting in one spot and they barely do anything. There's also the whole magic conch shell thing, which I personally don't find to be very funny. And it's probably some kind of allegory for religion or something, I don't know. Season 3 has quite a lot of Spongebob, Patrick, and Squidward trio episodes, but there are way better ones than this. This one's decent. Low 7 out of 10, number 28 on my list. Also, <laughs> nice animation error. As if a better season 3 episode will just fall right out of the sky! <laughs> fall right out of the sky! Would you believe me if I told you that it took me an embarrassingly long amount of time to figure out that the title for this one was a My Little Pony yeah, reference? Mom. Here's another installment in the series of episodes where Spongebob befriends some kind of wild animal or animal-like creature. Unsurprisingly, this one is way better than the last, as it not only completely avoids the bad house guest trope that Jellyfish Jam fell into, but this one is like 10 times funnier. My Pretty Seahorse is another one of those episodes where the jokes operate on double the time. Tray? There's so many of them in quick succession. We also have another new writer too, Kent Osborne, who's Paul Tibbetts' new writing and storyboarding partner for basically all of season 3. This one's a 9 out of 10 and gallops right to number 16 on the ranking. The only reason this one's a 9 instead of a 10 is because Mystery herself is kinda bland. They don't give her any visual distinctions from any of the other wild seahorses, and she doesn't have that much of a personality either outside of eating stuff. Who the hell do you think you are, Patrick? Funny story, actually. When I was a little kid, my mom painted the walls in my bedroom to be completely Spongebob themed. And she painted Spongebob riding on Mystery the Seahorse. But she got Mystery's color extremely wrong somehow? She painted her to be purple instead of green. Gee, mom, what are you, colorblind? This is a joke, by the way. My mom isn't actually colorblind. Don't say anything, Squidward. Remember your karma. <laughs> what? Ah. Ooh, eh, ah, ooh, oh. SpongeBob SquarePants always makes hamburgers, hamburgers look like the most delectable thing in existence, man. I wouldn't be surprised if this show single-handedly caused people to get fat because of this. I mean, this is the episode where Squidward fantasizes about fucking a hamburger, so... The lesson of you won't know if you like a certain food until you actually try it is so basic and vanilla that even preschool shows teach it. But damn it, I really like the way they do it here with Squidward finally giving in halfway through and trying a Krabby Patty. And because of his own hubris, doesn't want to tell Spongebob that he actually loves Krabby Patties, thus creating a fun character-driven conflict. That's something about Squidward's character that they emphasize a lot this season. That he actually is a child at heart just like Spongebob and Patrick, but because he's an egotistical asshole, it causes him to reject having fun until he is pushed to his absolute limit. Just One Bite isn't my favorite example of this in the season, but it's still great. Very high 9 out of 10, number 11 on the list. Though, nowadays, this episode is remembered as being the one with the most infamous deleted scene in the entire show. Squidward fucking dies. I just gotta act natural. Oh, that's real nice. The Bully is a pre-movie episode that I sometimes see some hatred towards, and I'm here to tell you heathens that you are completely missing the point. The premise this time is that there's a new student in Mrs. Puff's boating school class, named Flats the Flounder, and he wants to kick Spongebob's butt for no reason. That is the beginning and the end of the premise. 
It is one of the most gag-driven episodes in the entire pre-movie era. Once the opening finishes setting up the story, it is literally nothing but a race to the finish line seeing how many gags they can pull off with this setup. Which is an approach to storytelling I actually really, really like, especially with cartoons like this. People throw shade at this episode because of Flats himself, saying that he's a one-dimensional cunt one-off bully character. And because of that, it makes the episode annoying to watch. But like, that's the whole point? The episode is obviously making fun of these types of stories where a character gets bullied in school, and thus has the most one-dimensional stereotypical take on this character archetype as possible, with Flats having absolutely zero motivation for hating Spongebob whatsoever. Even after Spongebob saves the dude's life, he still wants to kick his butt, and that's where the episode's humor comes from. Pretty much what all of this has been building up to is that I just think this episode is really, really funny. Very high 8 out of 10, and is at number 19 on my ranking. And also, for one of the few times ever, we actually get to see Mrs. Puff act like a caring motherly figure to Spongebob, with zero strings attached. That's really sweet. Hi, I'm Spongebob. Oh my god. I am already happily, uh, moderately happy, uh, relative, I am- I'm Spongebob. Holy fuck, I'm coming up. Season 3 is easily the most mature season of Spongebob, and I don't even mean that in just the sense of there being more adult jokes than usual, but the stories and themes are more mature as well. Now, don't get me wrong, this is still a silly cartoon about a talking sea sponge with a zany art style and a screwball comedy sense of humor, but then you look at something like Nasty Patty and all bets are off. Yeah, I love the episode of this children's cartoon where two of the main characters try to hide what they think is a DEAD BODY! And they take their situation very seriously too, with Spongebob constantly on the verge of a guilt-ridden mental breakdown the whole time, and Mr. Krabs having a run-in with the police. Yeah, try advertising that to your target demographic of 6 to 11 year olds. Nasty Patty is the darkest episode of the whole franchise, by far, and I seriously doubt they will ever top it. The atmosphere here is unlike any episode before or after it. The colors, shading, and mood here are immaculate. Not even Graveyard Ship could pull off a look like this. It's one of the most stylistic looking episodes ever, and I wish they would do stuff like this a little more often, just to make each episode a little more visually varied. This is one of the easiest 10s out of any episode ever. Number 5 on my ranking, without question. Also, another episode that has a new writer, this time being my man, Kaz. Season 3 is the only season of the show that he wrote episodes for, for a while, but every episode he touched this season turned to gold. Remember this man for the future, he's going to come back again. Just like a zombie. Imagination. Meme! 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 Season 3 is on fire so far. This is another excellent one. Everyone knows why this one works. It's arguably the Spongebob, Patrick, and Squidward dynamic at its peak. Remember the paper from season 1? Remember how I hurled heaps of praise onto it? Because I thought it was the episode that understood what the show is all about at its core. Get the box cutter, because we're about to unleash Pandora's box on that idea once again. In the second season in a row that has an episode about boxes, the message here is told without flaw. Use your imagination is such a bitch basic moral for kids that it borders on being condescending. But it feels like they're aiming this particular message specifically at adults. Genuinely excellent decision to make Squidward the protagonist here. He's such a jaded adult like most people in the real world. And like I mentioned earlier, he is actually a child at heart like Spongebob and Patrick. He just lets his insecurities and egotistical nature always eclipse that. Why do you think Squidward keeps hearing all the noises coming out of the box? That's not Spongebob and Patrick's imagination at work. That's Squidward's masterpiece. 10 out of 10, number 10 on the ranking, 10s across the board. Pack it up in a box, label it, and ship it to your nearest fun-deprived adult. This is one of Tom Kenny's favorite episodes of the whole show, by the way. Actual Chadpole. 
as of writing this, the upcoming season 14 is going to have an episode that is a direct sequel to this one, and I do not know how to feel about that. Marmalade Mommy and Baba Booey 4 is the worst numbered MM and BB episode, and it's not even close. I usually love love shrinking and or growing episodes. They're usually really fun and can often provide a unique perspective for the animators to work from. But nah, this ain't it. Funny Squidward and Barnacle Boy interaction at the start and a My Leg gag notwithstanding. The rest of the episode is so overly violent, mean, and unpleasant for no reason. This would usually be the part where I would say in a fake, sarcastic way that I love the part where all of Spongebob's friends and family beat the piss out of his insides in really gruesome and disturbing ways, but no. No, I, I don't love that part. 3 out of 10, number 36 on the list. You already know what I think the worst episode in the season is. We'll get there soon. Also, Wumbo is the single most overrated joke in the entire franchise. Seriously, it's not that funny. Dude, Aaron Springer and C.H. Greenblatt must have really loved Mrs. Puff. This is the third episode about her that they've written together. Continuing the trend of making Mrs. Puff a delusional schizophrenic psycho with a criminal record larger than King Neptune's penis, penis. we actually get to see Mrs. Puff's prison life for the first time. Oh wait, no we don't, because instead the episode focuses on the very hilarious escapades of Spongebob and Patrick trying to break her out of prison. Which doesn't even matter anyway, because the whole ending was a dream. <laughs> okay, but like, for real though, it's a decent little episode. Even if they don't focus on what I wanted them to focus on, it's still an alright entertaining time with some good laughs, a guffaw or two and the realest Spongebob moment in all of ever. She's forgotten what it's like to live on the outside, to not be in prison. Coming to bed, honey? Yes, dear. 7 out of 10, prisoner number 27. I would not mind at all in the slightest if this was a concept they ended up revisiting in a future season. Mrs. Puff's backstory is one of the show's biggest mysteries, and while I don't want them to reveal it outright, Another Mrs. Puff prison adventure is very much wanted. This one is literally, literally just Spongebob and Patrick and Squidward standing around and talking with the occasional snowball being thrown. That's it. But unlike other episodes like this, such as The Secret Box, this one is completely carried by how hilarious the dialogue humor is, and how much I love the winter atmosphere. Almost every single line that comes out of the characters' mouths here is another classic Spongebob moment. I especially love the fort demonstration bit. And the winter atmosphere here might honestly be even better than in Survival of the Idiots, even if I like that episode way more than this one. My winter slash snow slash ice aesthetic bias shines through once again! It is absolute eye sex to look at, and the white and blue color scheme is w w w w b b b b b I would have absolutely loved more action in this all-out snow brawl, but there's an episode we'll get to in season 6 that scratches that itch for me anyway. Look at this unused painting from the episode. I wish the final thing was just as demented as this. 9 out of 10. Number 15. <laughs> Am I really gonna defile this grave for money? Of course I am! <laughs> look guys, look! It's the scene that people who know nothing about the Spongebob spin-offs like to spam! One Crab's Trash is one of those iconic status episodes, and it's all thanks to one singular piece of clothing. The soda drink hat. This bald coverer is so synonymous with Spongebob as a character for whatever reason that it's actually Spongebob's alt costume in Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl. It makes him look like a pretty girl, which is pretty based actually, I might have to invest in one of these. Wait, are soda drink hats even a real thing? I've never seen anyone wear these in real life. I gotta look this up real quick, hold on. Okay, so apparently they are real. 
Huh. This is also the episode where Mr. Krabs goes grave robbing in a creepy as fuck cemetery where he has to fight a bunch of sands. <gasps> Laugh, I said sands! <laughs> Sorry if this review is all over the place, but so is this episode to be fair. It hops from one thing to another like a bullfrog with ADHD, but honestly that works in its favor here. 8 soda drink hats out of 10, number 20 on my ranking. We can all agree that most commercials are sins against nature, right? Most of them are designed to be as obnoxious, or even sometimes as disturbing as possible, so they'll stick in your head like flies on shit. As Seen on TV does this too, but instead of being a brain tumor, it's like an earworm. In this one, the Krusty Crew make their very own commercial. What's a Krabby Patty? And afterwards, Spongebob becomes starstruck, mistakenly thinking he's famous and thus acting like a snob to everyone. I have a few friends who absolutely despise this one, saying that Spongebob's characterization is annoying as hell, with this one being another pre-movie episode where the conflict stems from characters being unlikable. I can see where they're coming from. I can also hear, taste, touch, and... uh the other one. But personally, I don't mind it here, as it's less about Spongebob being outright mean, but rather an oblivious egocentric. Which is still out of character, keep in mind, but eh. Honestly, this probably would have been an absolute certified banger if the whole thing was about the characters making the commercial. But at the end of the day, they still managed to squeeze some good material out of this one. High 7 out of 10, number 23 on my list. How long are you gonna keep us standing here? Well, Spongebob, are you just gonna stand there like a half-wit, mouth agape? Boy, beginning mouth! If I can get personal for a second, in 2022, I moved from one side of the country to the other, moving all the way from Oregon to Tennessee. We had to get away from an abusive family member, and we were about to get kicked out of our house anyway. I got to live with one of my online friends and his family for a while, while my mom and little brother had to stay at someone else's house. It was absolutely scary. Even though my friend and his family insisted it was okay for me to stay with them, I couldn't help but feel guilty. I felt like a freeloader, even though I had a job at the time. I always felt anxious, depressed, and scared, and even though I had a place to stay, my conscience felt filthy. I always felt like I could never repay them back. And don't worry, my family and I found our own place to live a while ago, and we're doing fine. But yeah, watching this episode now kinda makes me uncomfortable, even if I still actually like it. This might be the angriest we've ever seen Spongebob get. He is not fucking around anymore. He is a complete hothead, which definitely adds a lot of entertainment. This may be another episode where the conflict is that character is horrible to another character, but at least it actually feels like it fits with Squidward. 7 out of 10, number 24 on the ranking, which puts it right under the last episode. I like the maid outfit that Spongebob wears in that one scene, but outside of that, I kinda don't want to talk about this one anymore, so let's move on, please. <laughs> the title has weenie in it. Oh hey, it's another episode about Spongebob being as weak as a blade of grass, specifically in comparison to Sandy for some reason. And this is the first time I've even got to mention her in the video because for whatever reason, season 3 is the pre-movie season where she appears the absolute least. That's unfortunate. I won't be able to make as many jokes at her expense now. No Weenies Allowed is an episode that I should find as boring and humdrum as a bowl of nails, but this one is completely held up, by 10 buff guys, by how entertaining and funny the dialogue is. And when they do have the occasional moment in this one that's more lavishly animated, it certainly packs a punch. The scene at the end where Patrick beats himself up is meme tier. Also, it has Weenie Hut Juniors, which I'm surprised never became a recurring location in the show. 9 out of 10, number 17 on the list. On the Spongebob wiki, it says that this episode premiered on the same day as the release of Ice Age? Uh, random, but sure, go off.
Oh wow, so they were doing the whole returns thing before even the post-sequel seasons were. Yeah, remember Squillium? The cephalopod swimming in cash who would give Scrooge McDuck a run for his money? Squidward's lifelong rival? The character the post-sequel crew just hates with a burning passion for some reason? Yeah, him. He's back and hotter than ever. This is a plot structure the show has done three times verbatim over the course of the show. A character lies to another character and says that the Krusty Krab is different than it actually is. So when the second character comes to visit, the first character has to keep up the lie the whole time. And on top of that, this is my least favorite version of that plot, because I find it the least funny outside of the world's smallest violin gag. Don't get me wrong, I love seeing this wealthy asswipe Squillium again, and like Bossy Boots, this is another episode where the Krusty Krab gets a fun makeover, but the rest of this one is just... fine. Three star restaurant, number 30 on my ranking of restaurants. Oh! Gary? If you were a pedophile, you'd tell me, right? No! YouTube poops are peak humor sometimes. And so is this episode. This one definitely feels like a spiritual successor to Imitation Crabs. And while that one has a stronger streamlined story, this one is far freaking funnier. You know your episode has good jokes when some of them, such as Squidward's pirate bit, were ad-libbed by the voice actors, and they were so hysterical that they just kept them in anyway. This is one that I don't really have that much to say on, but I love it still. 10 out of 10, number 9 on my list. Mr. Krabs and Robots seem like a combination that's so random and out of left field, but the show does it surprisingly often. If Imitation Crabs was a cybernetic certified hood classic, then this one is a rad robotic romp for the ages. Gay? Homosexual? Is Spongebob trying to convert your kids? No, you stupid bitch. It's an episode of a children's cartoon making fun of parenting that just so happens to use two male characters. Shut the fuck up. This controversy had been building up for a ridiculous amount of time at that point that Steven Hillenburg himself had to outright confirm that Spongebob himself is actually asexual. Even if he constantly hits on other characters, mainly Squidward. Anyways, Patrick Prick. Season 3 thankfully doesn't pull the stunt nearly as often as Season 2 does, and unlike most episodes in Season 2, I actually really like the way it's done here. Really clever choice making Patrick a deadbeat dad. I say that like it's a good thing to be a deadbeat, Jesus Christ. This isn't one of my favorite episodes, but I do like it a lot. It's very cute and sweet. You know, despite the PTSD-inducing domestic disturbance. 8 out of 10, number 22 on the ranking. Season 3 out here flexing its mature themes like a spoiled rich boy flexing his new Lamborghini. Yo, look, it's the scene that completely tainted any discussion on the post-sequel seasons. Die! Number 6. The Tower. What? Do you need me to paint a picture for ya? There are a couple Spongebob episodes that are so untouchable that trying to say anything about them would be futile, and Wet Painters is definitely one of those. It's absolutely a 10 out of 10 and goes to number 4 on the list, there's no questioning that. It's literally just set up. Spongebob and Patrick are tasked with painting the inside of Mr. Krabs' house. And then the rest of the episode is, Go! Make gags! Be funny! Go! Go! I fucking love this Looney Tunes, Ren and Stimpy style of storytelling so much. The first two seasons had completely gag-driven episodes like this as well, but they ramped it up to the nth degree in season 3. Every single one of these episodes from this season turns out to be a fan favorite and an absolute gem. I could sit here all day and list off all of the great gags from this one, but I won't, cause you already know all of them. A lot of them are stretched out to their maximum length, too. So many of them are overly long in the best way possible. Nine times out of ten, Spongebob is the champion of these types of gags. One of this episode's writers, C.H. Greenblatt, must really love this type of humor cause it shows up in chowder all the time. 
I absolutely treasure how this whole thing is basically building up to an elaborate troll on Mr. Krabs' part. <laughs> He's only making things harder for the duo just because he thinks it's funny. I love it. This might not be my number one favorite of Season 3, but it is undeniably the Mona Lisa in Season 3's painting gallery. It's hysterical, it's charming, it's iconic, it's wet painters. Also, bruh, they just straight up turned on light mode in Mr. Krabs' house. And this is one of the few times where it actually looks better, to be honest. <laughs> True classics never die. In one of the most stylistically different episodes, Krusty Krab training video has earned its reputation as one of the all-time greats. Not only does the different format make it extremely memorable, but it opens up the door to so many comedic possibilities. With the premise as bare bones as, watch this training video for future employees of the Krusty Krab, they sure as hell went all out for this one. This is one that I can actually relate to a lot, cause as someone who used to work at Dollar General, I had to watch a bunch of these goofy ah uh, training videos. And this episode captures that cheesiness in the best way possible. Everything here has something funny, quotable, memorable, or just entertaining to watch. This might be the only episode in the entire series where every scene has at least one joke, gesture, quote, facial expression, anything that has become a pop culture phenomenon of entertainment. The I really wish I weren't here right now button, depressed Mr. Krabs, Patrick's appearance, the electric chair, the hoopla fish, maximum overdrive, poof, the fake out ending, the narrator, the transitions. My God, 10, number two. It's in my top 10 favorites ever. This is also the last episode that Aaron Springer and C.H. Greenblatt would ever work on together, as Aaron Springer would briefly leave the show to be a writer and storyboard artist for Gendy Tartakovsky's Samurai Jack, before fully coming back to the show in Season 5. This episode is living proof that SpongeBob SquarePants is a titan among cartoon characters. <laughs> the title has poop in it. Alright guys, backstory time. This is the first episode of Spongebob Squarepants that I've ever seen. When I was around 3 or 4 years old, my first ever exposure to the show was when my mom got me the Tales from the Deep DVD, with Party Pooper Pants being the DVD's headliner episode. Nearly 20 years later, and this is an episode I cannot stand now. Great! The entire reason why this one sucks so much is because of Spongebob himself. This is the worst portrayal of his character out of any episode in the entire series, bar none. Which really pains me to say because he's always been my favorite. He gets mad at people for having fun, yells at people for being late, purposefully cuts Squidward's cable just so he'll show up to the party, acts like a huge micromanaging stickler the whole time, and overall is a huge bummer who brings down the mood. This is the complete antithesis of Spongebob's character, which is odd to me, because one of Steven Hillenburg's biggest rules for the show is that Spongebob is not allowed to act like a douchebag or get overly angry. And if he does get very mad, it has to be a really rare occurrence. So I don't know why they let this slide. And by the time Spongebob gets locked out of his house, you know that they just completely ran out of ideas with this story. If I had to make a positive comparison here to explain an episode that does this type of premise right, I'd pick Party at Neutrons from Jimmy Neutron. Mainly because I just got done rewatching this cartoon. It's not an amazing episode or anything, but it actually takes advantage of its premise, the party stuff is fun and leads to some unique character interactions, one of Jimmy's inventions takes center stage and ends up saving the day, and is overall way more charming than this one could ever be. 4 out of 10, number 35 on the list. The only reason why this one doesn't get an outright bad rating is because the Patch of the Pirate segments are hilarious and endearing as heck. Are you ready for some real music? Oh! That and Underwater Sun is probably my second favorite song of the entire show. It's really catchy and embodies what the show is all about expertly. 
I can't believe such a fantastic season with hit after hit after hit would end up pooping on this party with this episode. Suck my ass. How is it that Party Pooper Pants is so crappy, but it's sandwiched in between four of the entire show's best episodes ever? That's like having a sandwich where the pieces of bread are the two most delicious pieces of chocolate you've ever had, but the actual meat is poop. It's a poop sandwich. poop sandwich. At this point, there's nothing really unique to say about all the gag-driven episodes. Your preferences for these will basically just depend on which plot setups you like the best, and which set of jokes you find the funniest. This one is still incredible, of course. In fact, it might be even more of a fan favorite than Wet Painters, somehow. But these episodes definitely blend in with each other sometimes, with each one just having a new coat of paint. Oh, I should have used that for the Wet Painter segment, Damn it! 10 out of 10, of course. Number 7 on my ranking. I would not be surprised in the slightest if this one was inspired by the Ren and Stimpy episode, Rubber Nipple Salesman. That one has a more methodical, slower burn to its gags, but in this one, the jokes just move a mile a minute. Absolute comedic classic. Even if I prefer vanilla to chocolate myself. Okay, now season 3 is just showing off. There is no reason the fifth Mimi Moo Moo and Bobby Bath episode should go this hard. I want to give an award to whichever Spongebob crew member thought up the premise of Barnacle Boy throws an angsty teen pissy fit and joins the dark side all because he didn't get a sandwich. I would not be surprised if this one only exists to make fun of supervillain origin stories and how ridiculous they can be. Mermaid Man is a true highlight here. He is so out of every scene he's in, like he's on another plane of existence or something. I adore how the entire episode is building up to this epic battle between Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy, only to actively piss on the concept in the episode's climax when the IJLSA accidentally defeat each other. Except for Sandy, who just dies of her own stupidity. Fun fact, this used to be my favorite episode of the entire series when I was younger. And if it turned out to be a 22 minute special like it was originally planned to be, it very well would still be the case. That's right, baby. Mermaid Man's a personal friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Another 10 out of 10. Number three in season three? Yo, and the chief is here too. And he's just casually interacting with these anthropomorphic underwater animals. This guy would actually return in the season 12 episode Swamp Mates, even going as far as getting the same actor back. Beast! I'll never view this one as anything less than super. Alongside X character works at the Krusty Krab, another plot type that the show does sometimes is X character goes to boating school, with one in pre-movie, one in post-movie, and one in post-sequel. I actually really like all three of them. Yes, even boating buddies. Some people might see this as lazy storytelling, basically taking a random character and plopping them into a random location. But the way I see it is that most of the characters in this cartoon have such strong personalities that you can make any episode work with any character and location combination. Also, hey, real quick, guys, look, it's a Super Smash Bros. fan meetup. <laughs> this would normally be the part of the review where I complain about Patrick being mean and unlikable, but thankfully they don't actually do that in this episode. Sure, he may be the cause of Spongebob getting in trouble, but it's all completely innocent and unintentional. They really must have had to walk on eggshells in order to not make him seem completely unbearable. Wait, eggshells? Like, Roger? Oh god damn it! 9 good noodle stars out of 10, number 18 on my good noodle board list. Season 3 specifically treated boating school more like an actual elementary school for some reason, and no other season in the show has ever done this ever again. Wow, way to get school. <laughs> Can't you hear the music? That's a 4-4 four, four string Ostiano in D minor! Everyone knows that means Luke's talking about clams! Erm, um, what the scallop? I literally just watched all of the Jaws movies for the first time earlier this year with my good friend Matt. 
So I finally understood the fact that this episode was supposed to be a parody of that first movie. Also, yes, in case you were wondering, the first Jaws movie is the only good one. All the sequels sucked, like everyone said they did. Even though this one is more of a light parody rather than a direct shot-for-shot -shot recreation of iconic moments from the movie, they pretty much hit the hammer on the head with this one. It's three dudes, one boat. <gasps> Holy fucking shit. Oh my god. It's three dudes, one boat, one dollar, and one beast. It's pretty much the bare fucking minimum you need for a story. But because the comedy is firing on all cylinders like most of season three, and because this is yet another episode that was concocted with a pinch of insanity, it manages to stand on its own two legs as its own episode. 10 out of 10, number eight on the ranking. Just like in the movie, they weaponized that damn music like a bazooka. Every time you hear it, you know some shit is going down. As is your fate when you tangle with the jaws of a monster. Yep, that's my reaction, alright. Me when I'm in a most boring season 3 episode competition and my opponent is UG. How did SpongeBob, Sponge, Sponge fucking Bob, mess up the characters but prehistoric premise when a lot of other cartoons get it so right? The Fairly Odd Parents, Jimmy Neutron, Phineas and Ferb, Looney Tunes cartoons, even Pac Man and the Big Gaping Sex Ventures beat you in this one. How is your episode so boring and so lifeless that Pac Man is better than you? There aren't even any dinosaurs or any Jurassic Park references, so what's the point? Ugg simultaneously feels both claustrophobic and empty at the same time, and that is not a compliment. The episode essentially takes place in one singular location, yet features so few characters and jokes. How do you even do that? This one deserves no higher than a 4 out of 10 and gets put at number 33 on the list. Just like Party Pooper Pants, Patchy and Potty utterly save this train wreck from being a complete disaster. Also, I associate this one with the YouTube poop banger, Patch Adams the Pirate Does Your Laundry. Hey kid! Oh! Now you're probably wondering, hmm, what's Patch? Oh! What's he doing in a cave? Good question, you little- Not only was this before comedy, but it was before entertainment too, apparently. I'm honestly tempted to take back what I said about Party Pooper Pants being Spongebob's worst role in the show because what the dick? Not only is he straight up abusive to Gary, but he's also weirdly sexist? What? Hot take, but I'm honestly glad Season 4 made some minor tweaks to his personality after this. Season 3 has some of Spongebob's best and worst moments ever. Gary cannot catch a break, dude. I feel so bad for the little guy. This is why most Gary episodes suck, by the way. They just insist on putting him through so much suffering. And not funny suffering either, like most Squidward episodes. But you know what? This is another Patty hype situation, where an episode's story sucks booty butt cheeks, but the comedy is so strong that it almost makes up for it. I definitely have an unpopular opinion when it comes to this, as if an episode has a bad story but good jokes, I still won't like it that much. But if an episode is extremely entertaining, but not that funny, I'll like it a lot more. Just wanted to say that again for future reference. 6 out of 10 races to number 29th place on my ranking. Mid? Mid? Any porn in this store? Okay, I'm straight up convinced that season 3 was made for a completely separate demographic than any other season ever. Hey kids, wanna watch a goofy Spongebob episode where one of the characters goes through a midlife crisis? Most kids in the show's target demographic probably don't even know what a midlife crisis is, let alone a regular crisis. This isn't me complaining by the way, if anything I adore this. It's one of the only Mr. Krabs centric episodes in the entire show where the conflict isn't something money related. I don't personally rate episodes based on relatability most of the time, but I can imagine that a lot of adults who watch Spongebob felt like Mr. Krabs here. I feel like Mr. Krabs here, and I'm only 21!
I should probably seek therapy for this, actually. 9 out of 10, number 14 on my list. I love it whenever characters can burst out of their usual bubbles, dip their toes in something that they don't really do. It's almost always really fun. Oh wait, this episode is banned now, right? Because of the panty raid scene? If they had a problem with it in the first place, why did they let the damn thing air on TV for years? Classic Nickelodeon. Open up! It's time for the pill! So we follow up a great Mr. Krabs episode with a pretty mediocre Mr. Krabs episode. How tragic. Sometimes 11 minutes just isn't enough time to tell a story, man. And Born Again Krabs is the textbook definition of this. It's the ever so classic jerk character has a close encounter with death and changes their ways story. Except replace death with the Flying Dutchman in his only appearance in season 3. In this enthralling tale, it takes half of the episode to set up the conflict, then there's one scene where Mr. Krabs is nice to people, then he goes back to being cheap again and sells Spongebob to the Flying Dutchman for pocket change. There's not much else to this one, I just think the pacing is pretty bad and leaves the episode feeling half-baked as a result. 4 out of 10, number 34 on the ranking. I never realized until now how many Mr. Krabs episodes were in Season 3, but this is easily the weakest one. Oh wait, shit, never mind, I forgot about Krabby Land, we'll get to that one in a couple minutes. Eleven out of ten, number one for all of season three. Of course my favorite season three episode would be the one about butts. One of my main personality traits is liking big butts and being unable to lie about it. Spongebob literally breaks his ass in a clam boarding accident, resulting in him developing a serious case of agoraphobia and refusing to go outside. So Patrick and Texas titties try every method at their disposal to get Spongebob to come outside. That doesn't sound like much, and really it's not, but like, every single second of this episode is armed to the cheeks with this show's best material of all time. This is the type of cartoony, wacky-ass shit I live for. Washing it off, person! Patrick, that's not fun! It is for me! A lot of these gags involve Squidward too, even though he barely appears in the episode. Dude, that ending where the live-action gorilla just shows up out of nowhere, shoves Patrick and Sandy into a bag, and starts beating the tar out of them, only for Spongebob to then question why there's even a gorilla underwater in the first place? And the gorilla rides into the sunset on this horse that just shows up for no reason? It's just... Mwah, peak comedy. This is THE funniest episode of Spongebob of all time. They brought their A++++ game here. For the two and a half people who have somehow never seen this unstoppable piece of media, I implore you, please check it out. Not only is this my favorite season three episode, but it's my favorite in all of pre-movie and in my five favorites, period. The fact that it's number one is no accident. Now, if only a certain season 8 episode didn't share a stupidly similar title to this one. <laughs> Krabby Land? More like... Crappy Land! <laughs> this might be the most infamous episode in all of pre-movie. People hate this one, dude. While I do think episodes like Grandma's Kisses and Dumped are way worse, this one still sucks and it's definitely my least favorite episode of season 3. But not for the reasons that everyone thinks. People hate this episode because of Mr. Krabs, citing this as one of his worst appearances in the show and saying how it's horrible and extremely unlikable for him to try and scam children. Honestly, this is the one complaint about the episode that I don't agree with. First of all, Mr. Krabs has done way worse, both before and after this. Need I remind you of the episode where he kidnaps an entire species and forces them into slave labor in a cold, dark factory? And second of all, fuck them kids, those little shits deserve it. In fact, these little brats are most of the reason why I can't stand this one. Here's something that most people don't really discuss ever. 
Most of the child characters in the pre-movie era are voiced by actual children. And while that makes it more accurate, it also makes them ten times more obnoxious. They spend the whole episode bitching, whining, and forcing Spongebob to hurt himself for their entertainment. Super original commentary, by the way. This is coming from someone who usually loves slapstick humor, but this is both extremely uncomfortable and annoying. Great combination! Also, the Krabby Land thing doesn't even come into play at all except for, like, one scene. An episode about Mr. Krabs building a shitty amusement park sounds really funny on paper, but this one is about as thrilling as a broken down Disneyland ride. Yeah, I think I'm done talking about this one now. 3 out of 10, number 37 on the list. This is one season 3 attraction that's so lame, not even the carnies want it. I wonder what's for dinner. Why didn't they just merge the camping episode with Club Spongebob and have an episode where the trio goes camping in the woods? Maybe some people wouldn't like that because it's a little more generic and sitcom-y, but I really did like the kelp forest setting. Anyways, the camping episode is an absolute iconic classic. Boring setting, and honestly, boring visuals in general aside. This one is cut from the same cloth as something like Snowball Effect, where both episodes involve Spongebob, Patrick, and Squidward doing something disgustingly simple, but managing to make the most out of it. They pitched up their tent of sponge bobbery and they stuck with it, damn it. The real stars of the show here, though, are the Campfire Song song and the Sea Bear. Oh. My. God. Here pictured is Dan Povenmire writing the lyrics for the Campfire Song song. Yeah, he's back on Spongebob for the last time. Campfire is right, this song is fire. So much so that it would be featured in an episode of Family Guy, which Dan Povenmire also directed. And let's not forget about the sea bear. He's literally just Freddy Fazbear. Hor, 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 hor. I don't care what anyone says, I love it to death whenever the show takes a land animal, gives it fins, and just calls it an underwater creature. That is a genuinely hilarious way to use land animals underwater. I don't care. Not one of my favorites ever, but still an 8 out of 10. Number 21 on my ranking. Ah uh, hell nah, they killed Squidward's house. Where did it go? Here we have the ever so classic, character's possession goes missing and the character has to find it story. Joke's on you Spongebob, I've never lost my Dollar General name tag before. Skill issue. The mystery itself isn't very strong though, unfortunately. A lot of the episode is taken up by this overly extended scene of Spongebob and Patrick dicking around in this one spot. But hey, at least it's funny. The show has always been kind of bad at telling mystery stories, honestly. The best one I can think of, ironically enough, is from season 6. Missing Identity is still pretty good, though. This one's a 7 out of 10, getting put at number 25 on my list. Apparently, this one was an episode idea that Steven Hillenberg had pitched since the very first season, so I wonder what took them so long to get this one made. One small thing I do actually really like is how since the twist at the end is that Spongebob was wearing his shirt backwards, you actually barely see his shirt collar at all throughout the whole runtime. They really sweat the details, huh? Felicitations, malefactors! I am endeavoring to misappropriate the formulary for the preparation of affordable comestibles! Who will join me?! I don't get it. Yo, Skippity Crabs! In terms of Plankton trying to steal the formula plots, this is easily the most creative one yet. With Plankton calling in his thousands of cousins to help him overrun the Krusty Krab with overwhelming numbers alone. So basically another generic surprise relative episode on steroids. And of course, they're all hillbillies to contrast with Plankton's mad scientist personality because contrast is very, very funny. This one totally stands out because they commit to having Plankton be the main character. In fact, Spongebob himself barely appears in this one. I'm pretty sure this is his smallest role in any pre-movie episode. It's always interesting whenever that happens. Speaking of character roles, Compuber. 
This is the first time in the whole show where Karen, Plankton's computer wife, plays an important role in the story. Hell, I'm pretty sure this is the first episode where she's actually named. If there's one thing, one thing SpongeBob unquestionably got better at as it went on, it was making Karen an actual character with an actual personality. Plankton's army is great though, no wonder this one was advertised as Plankton's last stand. It's a fantastic finale to the pre-movie Plankton plots. High 9 out of 10, number 12 on the ranking. As we reach the end of pre-movie, that also means we're gonna have to say goodbye to most of the writers and board artists. This time, it's Jay Lender and Sam Henderson. Both of these guys didn't really work much in the animation industry after Spongebob from what I could find, but Jay Lender got to be a director on Phineas and Ferb for a while, so I guess that's something. <laughs> and now for the chaser. <sighs> okay, so, uh, if you want to know why that line is so infamous now, go ahead and Google Spongebob behind closed doors. But please do so at your own risk. <laughs>Wow, they weren't lying. These season 3 specials suck. If there's one thing about pre-movie that a majority of people agree sucks, it's the specials in season 3. While this one is technically the quote-unquote best one, it's still not good at all. The sponge who could fly suffers from the same problems that episodes like Grandma's Kisses, Dumped, and a lot of post-movie episodes suffer from, and that is the meanness of it. Like, girl, fuck y'all and all your dreams. Dream? Dream! Forget the dang dang dream! The Bikini Bottomites here are horrible, and they deserve to have their skin removed. Also, here's something I bet none of you guys remembered. This episode is technically a musical. There's three songs, and they range from forgettable to legitimately getting cut off halfway through. Though, uh, Spongebob's got a... a huge dump truck, so... I guess it can't be all bad. They had so few ideas to work off of here that the Spongebob segments don't even start until seven minutes in. The patchy segments are as great as always, but dude, really? This special was a huge ratings trap and it comes across as absolutely shameless. Lost episode my ass, it should have stayed lost. However, one thing I will give praise to is the animation. It looks way cleaner than usual, and it kind of looks like a transition between the art styles in Season 3 and Season 4. Though great visuals and hilarious patchy segments can't salvage what is otherwise a pretty mid-special. It's this season's only 5 out of 10, getting put at number 32 on the list. <coughs> oh hey, it's Midward! How are you doing? <coughs> Kinda sucks that you're here though, means I have to call a special this season's Midward episode. Hopefully that never happens again. Look guys, I know nautical nonsense is kinda the show's thing, but does that really entail an episode where Spongebob gets hunted down by a LITERAL SERIAL KILLER?! I know Nickelodeon lets Spongebob get away with a lot more than other shows because he's their mascot, but CHRIST ALMIGHTY! This isn't some goofy villain who wants to destroy Spongebob in some wacky comedic way. No, he is called the Strangler! As in, choke to death! What the fuck?! As always, don't confuse this with me complaining. I absolutely love this character and this episode. While it is really dark, I'd still say something like Nasty Patty is more so. This episode is still lighthearted and silly throughout, despite the horrific premise, while Nasty Patty takes its stakes a lot more seriously. If I remember correctly, this is the first to kick off a tiny little subgenre of Spongebob episodes, where Spongebob will befriend some kind of hulking evil lummox, but throughout the episode, he ends up unknowingly hurting them just by being his silly spongy self. This is like, the perfect recipe for a Spongebob episode in my opinion. It's like this show's subversion of a Looney Tunes short, but instead of two people trying to hurt each other, it's one guy hurting another guy by complete accident, and it fits in with Spongebob's oblivious personality so well. Nine Stranglers out of ten, number 13 on my ranking. Bye everybody, thanks for coming! Bye Mr. Crab! Bye 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 the rest.
All right, guys, it's finally time. The finale of the entirety of the pre-movie era. Let's bring it all home. What do they have in store for us? Um, SpongeBob and Patrick do John Cena face because you can't see them. Ghosts ain't real like that one episode of the Cuphead show. There's a reused line from Frankendoodle. The Spectre Deflector as a name for a weapon shouldn't go as hard as it does. And this era ends with SpongeBob and Patrick being as naked as the day they were born. 7 out of 10, number 26 on my list. The end. It is Mario Luigi. That's Mama Luigi to you. Yeah! Okay, but seriously though, Pranks a Lot is one of those ones where everything surrounding the episode is a thousand times more interesting than the episode itself. I'm honestly glad that this one didn't end up being the series finale to the show like a lot of people think it was planned out to be. Not only because I think the show has produced tons and tons of fantastic episodes after pre-movie, but also because, not counting the movie, the fact that the last thing we would have seen in the show is Spongebob and Patrick being publicly humiliated it doesn't really leave the best taste in my mouth. Though, this is the last episode we'll ever see some of these writers. As mentioned before, Meriwether Williams went on to work on shows such as Camp Laszlo and Adventure Time. Kent Osborne not only went on to write for cartoons such as Flapjack, but also become a screenwriter and actor in multiple movies. And Paul Tibbetts... Well, everyone knows what he went on to do after this. Stay tuned for next time. <laughs> The end of pre-movie. The end of pre-movie. Woo! Let's fucking go! Um, this is a huge milestone in this retrospective. Uh, I can't believe I already reviewed three seasons of this godforsaken cartoon, but... You know, we're here now. Um, I genuinely wouldn't be surprised if some of the people who were keeping up with this retrospective at this point just dip after pre-movie, which... I mean, it's a free country, you can do whatever you want, but... There are a lot of interesting things I have to say about, um, you know, the seasons that follow, and... I will just mention right now, in case anyone is worried, I'm not going to immediately, like, switch my attitude starting with post-movie. Um, I've gone on record on social media before saying I do really like season 4. Um, but... Yeah, don't worry, I'm not gonna be, like quote-unquote sponge boomer about it um but enough of that uh, season three itself i mean you guys saw the video you guys know how much i love season three um a lot of people say that like oh season one is more atmospheric season three has like or season one has the best atmosphere season three has the best comedy and season two kind of has like the best uh, the best mixture of those but honestly i think season three has like the better mixture of the two because there's like a good balance of episodes that are like super wacky and like out there and zany and shit and like you know kind of more down to earth episodes which yeah i mean makes sense season three from what i've described in the video is like the most mature season not even just because of like again like there being a lot of adult jokes which there are a lot of adult jokes this season but there's also, like, a lot more mature, like, a maturity in the season, and I... Mm, excuse me, um... I feel like that definitely comes down to Spongebob's character, because I didn't mention this in the video, but honestly, in season three, Spongebob feels more like a straight man, or like an everyman kind of character, rather than, like, you know, the lovable, like, childlike goofball, which uh, the first Spongebob movie kind of, like, steered his character in that direction to where... He was just kind of like a lovable little weird little goofball. Whereas like in season three, he's kind of like, he still has like those childlike qualities, but they've definitely been dialed down quite a bit. So, you know, honestly, for as much as I disagree, sometimes I, I can't blame people for being kind of put off between like the transition between like SpongeBob's character in season three versus like season four onwards. Cause it is, like, I don't think it's as major as people, like, make it out to be, but it's definitely, like, noticeable. Um, but yeah, going back to the comedy, um, season three is definitely the best in this regard. Uh, even though I don't think, like, season three is, like, the best, or, like, my favorite season overall, um, if you guys were annoyed at the positivity I displayed in this video, you are going to fucking hate my videos on seasons 11 and 12. <laughs> But, um, 
yeah, season three is like comedy is unmatched, which I've mentioned over and over again in the video, but it really is true. And that not only comes down to, like I mentioned before, like there being more adult jokes and like SpongeBob's character being different, but I think like some other characters, like, you know, like Patrick, like they kind of backpedaled on his negative aspects that they, like, that reared their ugly heads in um, season two. Whereas, like, yeah, like, there are at least a couple episodes in Season 3 where Patrick is a prick or whatever, but it's a lot more dialed back in Season 3, and it's a lot funnier in Season 3. Um, though, of course, this is the last time we'll see, like, a majority of the writers and storyboard artists on the show, like, Meriwether Williams, Kent Osborne, Jay Lender, Sam Henderson, uh, C.H. Greenblatt isn't exactly gone yet, but he will be very soon. Aaron Springer, like does a few episodes in season four and then he returns uh fully in season five for a little bit um who else uh bill reese um a lot of the storyboard artists uh like one like it's just very interesting to me whenever like cartoons do this where there's like a major crew shakeup after a while which i think people don't really give enough credit to spongebob for that where it's like yeah, the show has had multiple crew shakeups over the years, yet, you know, regardless of the actual quality, they still manage to, like, make the show still feel the same while also feeling different. I know this ending segment has kind of been just me talking about other things relating to the show and not fucking season three itself, but I don't really have that much to say about the season other than that, yeah, it, it funny. Um... <laughs> Oh man, I'm, I'm terrible at these ending monologue things. I apologize. Um, I wish I could give more, like, insightful uh, commentary on Season 3, but uh, outside of, like, you know, the movie being produced at the same time, which, by the way, I want to mention really quick, I'm not going to um, review the movies on their own. Um, the movies are going to be way, way later in the retrospective after I've already reviewed the entire show. Um, all the movies are going to be in their own separate little videos. Bleh. All the movies are going to be in their own separate little videos, so look out for that. But yeah, as we reach the end of pre-movie, we're definitely going to see a lot of changes in the show going forward. Some are minor, some are major, but I honestly like most of them, uh, as you'll come to see, so... Be prepared for that. Keep a sharp eye out for the next video. Don't poke anyone, though. <laughs>